know it, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. It's a mystery that many people do not understand. And Paul the Apostle said, as you read, you will understand my knowledge, my understanding, my illumination of the mystery of Christ. In verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by who? I said by who? By the Spirit. It's the Spirit that now makes everything very clear, makes everything plain, so that now we can understand. My question to you is, what if you're a Christian? And you do not care about having the indwelling of the Holy Ghost within you. Just say, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. That's all you say. I'm born again, I'm born again. But you don't have the indwelling, the pouring of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There are many, many things you'll never understand. And because you don't understand, because you don't give the place to the Holy Ghost in your life, and the understanding is not that there will be so much confusion in your life. Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, you're born again. Yes, your sins are forgiven. But you live in confusion because you do not have the indwelling, the infilling, the baptism, the immersion of the Holy Ghost. That's why it's important for you to get saved and then get sanctified and then be filled with the Holy Ghost so that all you see is that you know come upon people and the confusion comes upon them. Confusion of the scriptures, confusion in their way of life. There's no light, there's no illumination, there's no revelation upon them because they do not have the baptism, the indwelling, the saturation of the Holy Ghost. I pray you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost because it is that baptism in the Holy Ghost that gives us that illumination of the Spirit of God. And then it comes up because it's a resident teacher, the resident teacher that teaches us the truth of the Word of God. What do you do? So you can have that in feeling, that in dwelling, that saturation, that baptism of the Holy Ghost. Number one, you must be born again. Number two, you must be sanctified. And after that, you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. John chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 17. John chapter 14, verse 17. Especially now, there are some preachers who are not even baptized in the Holy Ghost. And all when they come to the scriptures, all they use is their natural sense. Their natural sense. As they just interpret maybe with Shakespeare, they read Shakespeare and they can interpret Shakespeare, and as they read all the other secular writings, and because of their natural knowledge, they can interpret. And they come to the Bible, they come with the same natural mind, natural understanding, because they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. They are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they just interpret the scriptures the way they will interpret all the plays and all the writings of William Shakespeare. We don't do that. You are saved, you are sanctified, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then the Holy Ghost becomes the resident teacher, granting you light in the scriptures. We're looking at John chapter 14, verse 17. John chapter 14, verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not. The world cannot receive or must repent. Turn away from sin. Be born again before we can receive that Holy Ghost baptism and illumination. Neither knoweth him, but she know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Becomes the resident teacher living, abiding in you. We're looking at, uh, we're looking at. Uh, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading verses 3, 7, and 8. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. It says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You're saved, then you move ahead. You're sanctified, you're purified. The inner man is purged and cleansed and purified. In verse 7, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. He calls us to sanctification and to holiness. And then after that, he gives us the Holy Spirit. Acts of the Apostles, I'm reading from chapter 5, verse 32. Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 32. We need to have the Holy Ghost so that when you read the scriptures, you'll shed light on the scripture. 
when you read the scriptures, he'll give you illumination and light and interpretation. And then you'll be able to make that personal application to your life because the resident teacher, the Holy Spirit, is living within you and is a spirit of truth. We're looking at Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And ye are, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. And of course, after you are saved, and then you are sanctified, and you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you are very careful the way you live. You are very prayerful the way you live. And you do not grieve that Holy Spirit so that every time you need understanding, every time you need direction, every time you need guidance, because he's there as the resident guide, the resident comforter, and the resident supporter, and the resident sustainer, and the resident teacher is there. You don't want to grieve him so that he'll keep on illuminating your heart, enlightening your heart, and teaching you, guiding you into all truth. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from Bostachi. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. The people who really want understanding of the word and illumination in the word and teaching in the word and guidance in the word. And they know that now angels are not in the business of showing us interpretation. It's the Spirit of God that gives us the interpretation today. You want to have a good relationship with that Holy Spirit. And you want Him to remain there, resident in your heart, so He can keep on leading you into the divine truth of the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. You want him to keep on teaching you, grip not the Holy Spirit. You want him to keep on guiding you, grip not the Holy Spirit. You want him to keep on enlightening you, shedding light on everything that you read and giving you the interpretation. Like the angel gave Daniel the interpretation, grip not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of, of redemption. Let, uh, let all bitterness, that's what will give the Holy Spirit, your heart is filled with bitterness and anger and wrath. And then there's no place for the Holy Spirit now to be able to move freely and to guide you freely. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. The Holy Spirit moves in the era, in the dominion, in the area, and in the place of kindness and love and gentleness. Then the Holy Spirit will be able to move. You show that you are born again. You show that you are, uh, that you are sanctified. And that you are allowing that resident Holy Spirit to move freely within you. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. I pray God will give you understanding. I say God will give you understanding. We come now to Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading from verses 23 and 24. Daniel chapter 8. We come to the second point. The destructive power of Antiochus. The destructive power of Antiochus. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8 verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom. When the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And that's talking about somebody that will come after the Middle Persian Empire, after the Grecian Empire, that the kingdom of Alexander the Great will be divided into four. We've studied that already the previous week. And then there will be one little horn that will rise. And that little horn is what we're talking about here now that is uh, referred to as the king of fierce countenance. Understanding dark sentences, it shall stand up in verse 24, and his power shall be mighty, but not not by his own power. He will be mighty, but it will not be by his own power. It will not be by the power of the Almighty God. It will be engineered, stirred up, and filled with the spirit of Satan. It will be the spirit of Satan. It will be the spirit of the Antichrist that will actually fill him, and it shall be great. It shall be mighty. He will do great and mighty things in the negative way, bringing great oppression, persecution, difficulty, suffering upon the people of God because of that evil power that will be upon him. Verse 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall 
destroy terribly. It shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. It's talking about the children of Israel. You have such great, great oppression, power, tyranny upon the people of Israel. Let's look at chapter 7, verse 8. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. I consider the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the rules. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things, blasphemous things. They're still talking about that. And Teochus that came in the midst of the people. And then terrible things will he say. And terrible things will he do. Verse 23 of chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 23. And thus he said. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. Which shall be diverse, different from all the kingdoms. And shall devour, shall destroy, shall devastate the whole earth. Once again, do you see that? And some people think that the Antichrist, when he comes eventually, and Antiochus is like a forerunner of the Antichrist, just like John the Baptist was a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Antiochus was a forerunner of the Antichrist. And some people say, oh, don't worry about it. You are in Africa. Don't worry about it. You are in America. Don't worry about it. You are uh, in Asia. That when the Antichrist comes, he will only operate in the land of Israel, in the pleasant land, in the glory land all the rest of the people in the world there's nothing for them to fear it will not affect them but look at that verse again in verse 23 God he said the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth it's the whole earth which shall be diverse from all the kingdom and it shall devour it shall destroy it shall devastate the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So that you understand the power of that evil one that is yet to come. It will not just be upon Israel alone. It will be upon the whole earth. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it shall speak great words against the Most High. Can you think about that? Somebody that will be ruling. And then it will not just be that he has private unbelief, unbelief in his heart, unbelief in his own locality, but in the whole world, he raises up his voice against the Almighty God. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, one year, and times, two years, two and that's two now, and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years when that Antichrist eventually will come and then he'll do great, great, mighty things that will be very destructive upon the people. I pray you'll not be in the world at that time. We're looking at Daniel chapter 11 from verse 36. When that Antiochus, when he eventually came, that's what he did. But I told you already, it's just a forerunner of the Antichrist. When the Antichrist comes, he'll do great, mighty, terrible things, oppressing the people, destroying the people. And I pray that at that time, you'll not be here. Let's look at Daniel chapter, two, chapter, chapter 11 verse 36. And the king shall do according to his, his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak blasphemous and marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done it says this one has been determined and eventually it shall be done look at verse 37 neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all that is above all that is called God he'll be so blasphemous he'll not regard anyone that is called God he'll not regard any supernatural thing any spiritual thing he regards himself as the all in all by the way if you're like that today that means that you have the spirit of that antichrist you regard yourself as the all in all you are and nobody else 
and you don't regard neither the word of God nor even the authority of the Almighty God. All you think about is yourself. It's like you're on top and nothing can bring you down. That's the spirit of the Antichrist because when the Antichrist comes, that's what he will manifest. He will do according to his own will and will not respond to any teaching, any instruction, any exhortation, any challenge because he'll say, I am all in all. I am and nobody else. He'll try to compete with the Almighty God and that's why the judgment will come upon him. I pray that today anyone like that you will repent and when you repent you come to the Lord and bow before the Lord so that the Lord will have mercy upon you and then a kind of pride that makes you to compete with the Almighty God the Lord will break that pride and then you're able to humble yourself in the sight of the Almighty God and the Lord will have mercy upon you I said the Lord will have mercy then in verse 38 but in his testing shall he honor the God of forces a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. It says when the Antichrist comes, he will not know the God of love or the God of kindness or the God of mercy or the God of, of uh, gentleness. All he will know is the God of force. All he will use is force. Anything he demands, anything he wants, it will be by force. Are you like that? If you are like that, you have the spirit of the Antichrist. If everything you want in your life, everything you want to accomplish, it's all by force. It's by do, do or die. Give it to me or I take your life. Give it to me or I make you feel miserable. If you are like that, you are serving the God of force. And it's like the Antichrist. And the Lord is saying, the Lord is revealing all these things so that the day will not come upon us unaware, so that you will turn, so that you will change, and you will not allow the spirit of the Antichrist to have the overpowering influence, overwhelming influence upon your life. It says in verse 39, Thus shall he do in the most strong hold with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for him. By the way, as you read about all this, you are wondering, why will God allow this uh, for the children of Israel? Why did it come upon them? Let's come back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. When the children of Israel were driven to the land of Babylon and they suffered in the Babylonian captivity, that Babylonian captivity and suffering was to soften their heart, was to make them return unto God, was to make them repent. But instead of repenting, can you imagine that a nation suffering for 70 years in the captivity of Babylon, and yet the suffering, the oppression, the persecution, and all the pain of those 70 years in Babylon never changed them. You know, we were, we were saying that if oppression comes upon any group of people, persecution comes upon any group of people, if suffering comes upon any group of people, you will think that the suffering will soften their heart, that the suffering will change them, that the suffering will turn them around, that the suffering will make them to say, oh, that's enough, oh God, that's enough, we we'll repent, we'll turn away from our sin. Look at it in chapter 8, verse 23. Chapter 8, verse 23. Is telling us now in verse 23 and in the latter time of their kingdom when the transgressors are come to the full when the transgressors are come to the full as god expected that the persecution will change them the suffering will change them and all the untold pain will change them for 70 years and yet they didn't change they didn't repent because of that god said all right when the transgressors are come to the full and the transgressors just keep on transgressing he said because of that in that verse 23 then he says a king of fierce countenance and understanding that sentences shall stand up and that is what you find not only for the children of israel at that time in second chronicles chapter 28 second chronicles chapter 28 i'm reading from verse 22 second chronicles chapter 28 Verse 22, and in the time of his distress did he trespass yet more against the Lord. This is that king Ahaz. In the time of his distress, in the time of his suffering, in the time of his pain, you will think that the pain will make the man to say, oh God, that's enough, I'm sorry. 
I've done evil, I'll do that no more. This suffering is too much, this pain is too much, and this distress is too much. Now I repent. That's what the Lord expected. But it didn't happen that way. Even though the pain was there, the persecution was there, the suffering was there, the pressure was there, the distress was there. The Bible says there, in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? You know, sometimes uh, like that, when you, uh, somebody has been disciplined because of adultery or fornication, immorality, and sometimes an uh, announcement is made, and you think because of that shame, public shame, because he committed that terrible sin. And everybody says, how could he do that? How could he do that? And then he's placed on discipline. In the midst of that discipline, in the midst of that rejection, in the midst of that suffering, he still continues in that evil sin. Just like that man who are read about in the time of his distress, yet he sinned the more against the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 5, when the transgressors are come to the full, that's when the king of fierce countenance will rise up. If the Lord has brought some pain, some suffering, some, uh, some pressure upon you because you have sinned privately, even though no man knows it, you should go on your knees and say, oh Lord, I'm 